Well, good morning. Uh, Rudy uh, Norlander joining me this morning. Uh, just a few months ago, Rudy, your uh, life uh, took on a little different uh, <laughs> approach than I'm guessing you had planned for in September. Let's talk about that. Uh, <laughs> let, let's, let's, go, let's, let's go into that a little bit if you can. The day of the attack? Yeah. Well, I rented some side-by-sides to a father's son for opening a week of those season. Mm -hmm. And they had had a mechanical issue with the machine. They called me and said, hey, could we swap out the machine with the one that they had the first couple of days? Because he actually had two sons out with him the first weekend. Mm -hmm. The youngest was 10, I think. So it would have been pretty traumatic if he would have still been there at Heathlew home. But I went and swapped the machines. And he's like, yeah, my son wounded a nice hook yesterday and lost his trail. I said, well, back in my young days, I used to be a hunting and fishing guide. I said, so I'm a pretty good tracker. I can come out tomorrow and help you if you want. And he's like, sure. So they were kind of up on the mountain. So I texted him and I left and I said, I'm on my way up. And he said, well, we hiked the side by side on the trail. So I just ran up the trail until I saw the side by side. And he had texted me at the drought and I once I got to the side by side, I said, I'm here. Is the thin drop where you shot the deer, where your camp is, or where you are? Mm -hmm. And of course, with cell service and whatever, I did get his text back for quite a while. So I started heading down the trail because I could tell it was north of this trail and west of this trail. Mm -hmm. So I started heading down the old mule trail. I get about a mile or so down there and I get his text and he says, oh, that's where we shot the duck yesterday. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said it's easier to come down the ridge than hike down the trail because then you don't have to mess with the cliff. Mm -hmm. It's like crap. I've already <laughs> passed the first cliff. Right. And there's two cliffs on that ridge line, so it's like, well, I'm going to shoot up through the trees right here between the two cliffs and get to the ridge and kind of wait till he tells me whether I'm going up or down. And I got hardly maybe a hundred feet into the tree line, and I jumped a small grizzly there, probably his first year out on his own. Mm -hmm. And he took off like a shot, and I immediately pulled out my pistol at that point. And uh, from that moment on, you know, I'm looking all around me, and mm -hmm. I got my pistol in my hand, and. I've been shadowed and stalked by theirs before in my life, so I was looking constantly around, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I hiked up the ridge and over to the next ridge because I could hear some crows circling and congregating and squawking. So I hiked over to the next ridge and hiked down to where I jumped the first there. And then I got the text from George, he's like, yeah, that's where we shot the duck and we left our dac hacks there. So I hiked back up the ridge, found their dac hacks and said, hey, I got the dac hacks. He said, well, just stay there. I'll send my son to come get you only five minutes away. So I grabbed a drink and had a piece of jerky and thought to myself, I should send the cylinder on my revolver because I always leave a dead shot in the cylinder that's going to fire next in case my kids got a hold of it. So I spun the cylinder and walked over, George, the son came over and we walked over to where George was. And he was actually sitting on a hillside right under the ridge that I just walked past, watching the same crows I went to look at. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't see where they were landing because the woods were so thick. And uh, we said, well, We'll kind of do like they do on the movies or TV when they're looking for a body or whatever. We kind of spread out so we could see everybody in current our country. Mm -hmm. I was up on the uphill side. The father was in the middle and the sun was on the bottom. And we just started hiking down towards where the crows were. And I stepped over a log, looked over to see where George was, and there the air was coming at me. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I had time to do was lift up my gun and fire, and I then discovered that I just automatically hooded it back to the same bullet, so it misfired, and then he was on me. Right. And I know his fist, or his nose is about the same size as my fist. And I got a bite mark there and a 
light right there. I assume that's when I take a swing at his nose, that's one of my dare defenses. If you ever hit a dog in the nose, you know it right. makes him sneeze or whatever. So that's always been one of my tactics to use of a dare attack, is to try and punch him in the nose. Whether I connected or not, I don't know. Next thing I know, he had me by the jaw. He take me up off the ground by my jaw. And I could see George running towards me, and I said, help me. And then it clamped down and broke my jaw. Mm -hmm. I got a tooth on this side and a tooth on that side on the bottom. The rest of it's gone. And at that point, I think he lost the grip of me and I fell down. Mm. I don't remember the next few seconds when he stepped on my chest. And he was heavy enough with his claw to collapse my chest. And then he bit my leg. Mm. And... Uh, George and his son were throwing rocks mm -hmm. and sticks at him and yelling at him, and he finally ran off. <clears throat> now, that was... September? September. Here we are, middle to the end of February. What, uh, what has been going on in your world since then? I would imagine you've spent some time with doctors and, and that I kind of I sent high leaks in the hospital in Utah. Mm -hmm. um, they flew me first from the site to the Yellowstone Club. Mm -hmm. from the Yellowstone Club to the Ozone Hospital. They did a tracheotomy and a chest tube and, mm -hmm. and flew me to Salt Lake. And I don't know how many surgeries I had. I know that jaw reconstruction was like a 10-hour surgery that day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still got at least two more surgeries to go. Mm -hmm. You still go back? You still go back out there. I mean, it didn't scare you out of the woods. It oh, didn't. No. No. no? Nothing's going to scare you out of the woods. Yeah. I've been I didn't hunt in the woods and hiking in the woods since I was little. Mm -hmm. Your your thoughts on the bears and things like that? I mean, it's just uh, it happened. I mean, well, it, it's an unfortunate event, and it was probably one in a million. Most bears will take off this way as quick as you go that way, and mm -hmm. I tell people all the time. Usually you can hear them or smell them before you mm -hmm. ever see them. Because mm -hmm. they're not real stealthy, they're not quiet about their movements unless they're actually stalking something. Mm -hmm. But hindsight, you know, the way the little bear reacted and the way the big bear reacted, I guarantee it that any time that big bear was going away from his food cache, that little bear was mm -hmm. jumping in. And so the little bear was used to being chased off, and the big bear was used to chasing something out of there. Right. And so that's probably the main reason that that interaction happened so quickly, because mm -hmm. he was on alert, and the little bear was on alert, and so, yeah, they both acted according to how they'd been acting. What would you suggest to people that are going to go out in the way? I mean, they're, it sounds like you did everything you were supposed to. I mean, in hindsight, of course, you can go back and question some of the, and, well, uh, but still. You, you get, you know, I know the fish and game and the police and everybody say, well, you got to do this in their country. And it's like, well, that's not what you do when you're hunting. Mm -hmm. You don't want the wind in your face, mm -hmm. or you want the wind in your face. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to make noise because you don't want to jump a wounded animal and make it run. So those two aspects don't apply. And people say, well, you should have had their straight. I did have their straight. It was right in front of my holster. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't even have had time to probably get my gun out of the holster if I would have had it holstered. The mm -hmm. only reason I even got one chance of a shot was because I already had it in my hand. Right. Yeah. But this. I mean, I, I can't imagine it, it unfolded, this story you're telling me, it's almost so surreal because you've been doing this for a long time. You've been out in the woods for a long time. This has been one of those things. And it's never happened before, but on this day, September 8th, it just was your time? I it, mean... All the stars aligned and it happened. Yeah. I actually, uh, in the hospital, I had a dream that this was actually an answer to my hers. Really? Yeah. But why would you say that? Why would that be? Well, because my business is small, mm -hmm. and some years I wonder whether I'm going to make it to the next season or not. Mm -hmm. So I've been praying to God to, that he knows that my business is good. It gets people out, it brings families together. So he knows that what I do is a good job. Mm -hmm. And I 
prayed and said, you know, if you want me to keep doing this, I need help mm -hmm. financially. And I expected, you know, to win the lottery or sweepstakes. I didn't I there. <laughs> but in the dream, it told me that this would open doors and it would help me succeed and it would awaken people to my business and my business would grow. This is not winning the lottery. It's not winning the lottery. <laughs> and I had one guy, of course, on social media said he was rooting her the dare and it was my fault her being in his territory. And one guy said he didn't have any sympathy because I got plans for a book and a movie. And so I just didn't hurt the money. It's like, yeah, I just went out and snacked it there so I could get rich. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody would have no, submitted themselves no, to what you went through no, in that. I, I know they wouldn't. Most people probably wouldn't have survived. You, you, you feel okay now, though? I mean, yep. other than you say you have some more doctor's visits and some yep. things like that? I, I still have numbness here and there, and I still have some surgery and some dental work to do. But mm -hmm. if it wasn't for this, I would have been out of the hospital and back at it within a week. Right. But then I wouldn't be saying this either. <laughs> I would have just done another there tax or either. Right. It, it seems to me that you have an opportunity to, to share your message, though. I mean, you are a bear survivor, and that, that yeah. doesn't always happen in circumstances like it, that. What, what message do you want to share? What is the message you want to give people? I, I told the people in the hospital early on that I wanted to be the quickest there recovery survivor ever. And I had to rephrase that because, like I said, I would have been out of the hospital a little quick. But I had to revise it to say the quickest throat there attack recovery error because my odds are pretty good in Vegas because no seal don't survive. Right. And the doctor said less than an eighth of an inch on one side, and even less than that on the other side, and I wouldn't be here. Hmm. So I'm only here by the grace of God that he didn't bite down just a little bit more. Well. And, uh, you know, something like this happens to you, you can either go up or go down, and I don't choose to go down, so. So you're still here. So you keep on going, and you hope through the death.